So in this video, I'll show you how to make a solar powered integrated temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, and soil moisture sensor array. So basically a little miniature outdoor weather station. So first off, let's just get a quick overview of the parts that I used. Um, it's actually a very simple little build. So the first thing you'll see is the solar panel. This is a five volt, three watt, solar panel that I got off of Amazon, and it comes with an integrated uh, base, mount, and USB cable with a little adapter that goes to USB-C, which is important because the ESP32 board that I'm using requires USB-C for the interface. So here are all the parts, and like I said, it is very simple. So the brains are gonna be this ESP32C3C Zhao, and um, those things are great little boards because they give you just enough for a simple project like this and they come with built-in on board lipo battery management so by the way for a reference this is at esp32 s3 Zhao. um the pinout looks basically the same so i'm just using it as a demo because i don't have another uh, ESP32 C3 version open, but it looks exactly like this. Um, so the advantage of using the little Zhao in combination with this system is the solar panel that I'm using is a five volt, three watt panel. So it's gonna output 600 milliamps of power into the USB connector here on the Zhao. That then is managed by the onboard LiPo chip to charge the battery. And so uh, during the day, the battery gets charged up. And then at night, because there is uh, circuit protection in here, um, the battery can supply power to the ESP32 and power everything even when it's dark. And so the combined built-in battery management system actually allows for that solar panel to work uh, charging the battery during the day, and then the battery takes over at night, so you get constant power. That also allows for a really, really small battery to be used. So the LiPo battery that I'm using is a 180 milliamp hour battery, and so you can see it is very, very small. And so for packaging purposes, that's great, because you don't need a lot of battery, because it only needs to run this thing you know, maybe 12 to 16 hours. I've actually measured and I anticipate this battery will actually power this system firing up like every 15 minutes. Um, it'll probably last for three to five days, I would expect. So you shouldn't have any problems, even if you get a few rainy days in a row, you should still have this uh, sensor set up work just fine. Now the sensors themselves, again, I am using that capacitive soil moisture sensor from a previous video. Um, it's very straightforward to use. It's just got ground voltage in and then an analog voltage out. So you run that into an ADC pin on the chip and it can be calibrated to fairly accurately measure the soil moisture um, where the sensor is mounted. And then you've got the Bosch, uh, this is a BME 280. And so if you look, uh, I am using the version of this board, it's got these two mounting holes. I believe there are a couple different configurations for this thing. Uh, one of them is designed for a five volt uh, input. This one's a 3.3 volt input. Um, it's got six pins, but you only actually need to use four of them on an I2C bus to communicate with the ESP32. So i um, only gonna be using four out of six pins. And so on the back, you can see um, maybe this thing's really, really small. You've got VCC, so that's gonna be the 3.3 volt in. You've got ground, and then you've got the SCL and SCA pins for an I2C bus. So it does have a couple other pins. I think maybe that's like a shutdown or maybe something for uh, SPI communications. But since we're only gonna be needing this for, um, that does simplify the wiring of this whole arrangement. And so that's it. You just need these four components with the solar panel, and that's all that's required uh, to build this thing. Okay, so next up, uh, let's open up the case and I'll show you how I've got everything arranged inside of the base. All right, so the way I built the base um, is basically using the uh, built-in solar panel kind of connection. And so uh, if I unscrew this on the bottom, um, you'll see that there's just a, uh, a threaded mount that clamps the top on, that falls off. And so here's the base. 
Um, it's plastic and it has these three kind of sheet metal or wood screws on the bottom, just generic screws. And so I use those to create the housing for the, uh, the sensors and the ESP32 down here. Before I get too far, you'll see that it comes with a little cutout for the USB cable. And so uh, here's the base being open. Now it's all still connected, so I'm gonna have to be careful here. I just designed the enclosure to be able to mount with this base. And like I said, it's got a little cutout here uh, for the USB. I will probably think about making other cutouts uh, because one of the things that's important, and you'll see I have that uh, BME 280 mounted on the top here. It's important that that actually has access to the air so that it can accurately measure all the atmospherics, right? So you do need to have that thing able to get airflow. And so that actually requires some care in designing an enclosure because what you need is something that will allow air to get in here, but not allow rain and water to get in. Um, and so that is kind of a trick. And so basically I've got these two passages here that can allow for air and I've designed it in such in a way so that whenever this thing is mounted, where the USB cable comes in is offset, and that will make it more difficult for water to get in while still allowing for some breathability to get in there so that this thing can measure, again, barometric pressure and humidity uh, fairly accurately. Um, that also requires that the USB cable be wrapped around and under, so it basically has a pathway um, to avoid the screws but still exit this enclosure. Okay, so again, I've got the, the temperature, humidity, and barometric pressure sensor mounted to the outside. That way it can have access to everything. And then inside, let me open this thing up, and I'm going to unplug the ESP32 here. And so there's just a little passage where the USB cable can enter on the top. And then here's the inside of the sensor. You'll see uh, the lid, again, just a passage for the USB, and then a little passage or a four pin connection, because uh, I'm only using four pins on the BME sensor here. Um, I went a little bit overboard on the connectors. Uh, now that I've got everything kind of working, if I were to do it over again, I would not use as many connectors and I would hardwire more, just because that would save a little space on the inside uh, packaging. It's not super tight. Um, again, if I was doing point to point wiring, it would actually be plenty of room, but since I use connectors, on a little breakout board that ended up taking a bit of extra space here. So down on the bottom is the passage where the capacitive soil moisture sensor can come through and stick out the bottom. I've just got some hot glue holding that in right now. Um, that is not a permanent solution because uh, this type of glue is going to be susceptible to moisture. Um, and so I'd probably use epoxy or silicone adhesive to actually mount this thing in a permanent fashion down there. Um, again, this is my first kind of unit. It, it worked. And so um, again, but I, I did kind of construct it so that I could take it apart and redo it if I found that anything wasn't working great. So internally, again, you've just got the components wired in and I used a bunch of connectors on a little breakout board. Um, the only other thing that I haven't mentioned so far is uh, the C Zhao's uh, the SP32 C3 version does not have an internal way to measure battery voltage. And so on the breakout board, it's gonna be kind of hard to see. Let me zoom in here. I do have, you'll see a couple of resistors there that I made a voltage divider to go to an analog pin, and that's required just to monitor battery voltage. Um, it, it works great. I, you know, I wish they had that internally on the board. That would reduce, you know, the requirement to have a voltage divider. But it, it's, you know, that is what it is, and it's just something of using these little tiny boards is there's only so many pins available. Um, and so they've chosen to give you access to one, in case you're not using a battery and don't need to monitor voltage, you've got an extra pin that you can use for something else. Um, but that's kind of it. You know, that's the enclosure. That's how everything works. Um, again, it's very, very simple. Um, and I will be posting uh, step files for the enclosure that you can modify it as you see fit. Now, let's talk about a couple of the trade-offs. Like I said, that I made the compromises in this design, because if you know a lot, about the way LiPo batteries work, the first issue is by using the solar panel during the day, there is a possibility of potentially shortening the lifespan of the battery because it is being charged 
every day for as long as the sun is out. And that can potentially reduce the lifespan of the battery. There are a couple of mitigating factors though where I think the battery life and I don't just mean the life on a single charge, but I mean the lifespan of the battery, hopefully will be longer than usual. Um, number one is the depth of discharge is very small every day. So uh, the way I've got this thing configured is it's waking up about every 15 minutes. And so um, during the night, I'm only using maybe 10% of the capacity of the battery. And so the lifespan of a LiPo battery is short. They measure that based on how many cycles it can be charged and discharged. And it's only like three to 500 charge cycles. However, that's based on a deeper discharge than I'm using. So that should matter and help lengthen the lifespan of this battery. The other thing is that whenever they measure the lifespan, that's to a 70% uh, charge capacity. So they're measuring how long until the full capacity is only 70% of its uh, new lifespan or new depth of charge. And the thing is, is since we're only using 10% of the capacity anyway, um, it will last longer because that 70%, well, it's still got plenty of life um, to run this thing overnight, even if it's you know less than it started with. So I do think the battery ought to be okay for longer than the, uh, the base kind of expectation. If you wanted to protect the thing more, you would need an external battery charging board. That's not super expensive. They probably cost three to five dollars, but it takes extra space. It's an extra component. It's extra cost. Um, and then you'd have to configure that to not charge this thing up as much. And so I just didn't want to mess with it. It adds complexity and cost that I didn't want to mess with. I wanted to keep this thing super simple. So that was one compromise to this design. The other compromise is in the BME 280 itself. There's a known issue that if you use the measurements, like if you measure really frequently, that this chip self heats and that will cause some inaccuracies in the temperature readings. Um, I've done a couple things to try to mitigate that. Number one, this sensor only is on 15 seconds every like five to 10 minutes. It, it's not used that intensively. So that should help limit that self-heating issue. The other thing is I'm only using 1x oversampling instead of the default 16x oversampling. And so that further reduces the intensity that the chip is being used when it's pulling readings. So that should also help to limit the, uh, the self-heating effect. However, um, it's known to not be the most accurate temperature reading that you can get. Um, if you wanted more accuracy, you'd need to add a secondary temperature sensor. But again, then you're into extra complexity and things like that. Um, the other errors that come in are the fact that the housing is very small um, and it's going to be pretty much in direct sunlight for the solar panel to work. And so the sensor housing, the actual enclosure can be heated directly by the sun and you're gonna get some inaccuracies because of that. Um, the best type of temperature readings are gonna be in the shade in a well ventilated place to really get the accurate air temperature. So this is perhaps not the best design for that. Um, and then that also leads to the fourth issue with the temperature readings is that I do have this thing mounted above the rest of the enclosure. And so during the mornings and sometimes when the battery is being charged, uh, that can heat up and that heat can rise and also add a little bit of extra air to the temperature readings. So all that to say, the second problem is the temperature readings may not be the most precise. However, um, in actual practice, the past few days since I've been testing this thing, it's generally been within a degree or two of other measurements that I've taken of the ambient temperature. But, you know, just buyer beware, if you build one of these, it's not going to be as accurate as if you built a full Stevenson enclosure and hung that in the shade. Yeah, that would be better. Um, but for my purposes in an all-in-one unit that's really small, kind of aesthetically nice, uh, this is a pretty good little setup and it does good enough for my purposes. Um, so I will post out, um, I'll probably build a little git for this thing that will have the enclosure design and some step files. I'll put out a schematic for the wiring. 
I'll also put out um, the YAML code that I'm using. Now, be aware, it does use a couple of things um, that I haven't covered in this video, such as like, you know, I didn't describe how all the code works because what I found is uh, nobody watches that part anyway. So I'll put the code out there. Just be aware that it will require a little bit of configuration. Um, to integrate everything into the dashboard, I'll put up uh, some code for the uh, the Home Assistant side, but this is using the OTA update method that I covered in a previous video. So I'll link that video down below and you need to watch that to understand how to integrate uh, that OTA mode stuff into your dashboard. But otherwise, like I said, I'll put the code out there for this and the integration that I'm using in the dashboard, how that all looks. Um, but that's it. It's actually a very simple little thing and it's been working pretty well for me. So anyway, if you've got any uh, comments or questions, just feel free to leave them down below. Thanks.